welcome everybody for being here today. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy day to come and hear us. And uh, hopefully you'll get something out of this today and hopefully help improve your financial future. Um, thank you also to the San Francisco Library for having these wonderful events, as well as Jonathan for helping guide me to make sure that I'm doing everything that's generally right. Um, so today you're going to have myself and Jim go through roughly is going to be a, a longer than normal class, about a, an hour to an hour and a half class uh, on retirement. Why it's longer than normal is because it's a lot of material here and it requires us to spend this uh, additional amount of time. So um, that's from our perspective. Now, you do have an experienced crew, as Jonathan already told you. Uh, Jim has been a, a successful investor for, for many, many years. He's been involved with Better Investing for a number of years as well. Um, he's also retired, so he's been through this whole game once. I myself have been a bit part of Better Investing, as we already shared, for roughly 30 years. Um, but I'm also a financial professional, so I've been in the business for the last 40, 50 years, it seems like, 40 years. Um, I have, a, as you need to see, a couple initials after my name. I'm a certified financial planner, as well as a chartered financial analyst, which basically means I, I've spent my life analyzing companies. I spend my time now with a small firm in Alamo called Blossom Wealth. But I do spend a lot of my time teaching, and I like to teach because I find teaching uh, is a good way to get information out to everybody. So with that, um, I am going to shift over to our next slide here, uh, which is our disclosures or disclaimer. And basically here, we're, everything we're going to talk about is for educational purposes only. We're not recommending any securities. We're not recommending any services. Um, we're just here for education purposes only. What we're planning to cover today is who we are. We're going to spend a minute on who Better Investing is um, as a group, uh, but focusing the rest of the time on retirement is in your future. What are your plans? Um, focus on uh, class uh, is on asset allocation and planning, um, but spending a lot of time walking through some things to think about as you get closer to retirement. Whether you're young or old, I think there's items in here that will help you uh, accomplish uh, a better retirement over time. We do have a couple comments of what you should be doing when you're younger. We also have some comments of what you should do when you're older. Uh, also, well, how do you how do you spend your time in retirement? We'll touch on Social Security and a couple other things. But let me just be really clear: the financial industry and a lot of people will highlight what you see as pictures on this slide: beaches, golfing, boating. And, 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 and they really want to promote retirement is fun and, and maybe retirement is fun. Um, I think it can be, but it might not be as fun as, as everyone thinks it might be. And we'll get to that in a second. I do want to spend a second on better investing just real quickly. And then we're going to spend a little bit more later at the very end. Um, it's been around for 70 years. We're not, we're not just something that just popped up two years ago. We're, I work, for, or not work, I participate with the 501c3, which is a nonprofit organization. So we are volunteers. Jim and myself are both volunteers. And we're part of the 700 plus volunteers around the country. We are part of the San Francisco chapter, one of the 64 chapters that are around the country. We, we've become known over time for modern investment clubs. And we're going to highlight that a little bit later. There's one in San Fran, one that's uh, a publicly available investment club called the San Francisco Model Club. We'll touch on that a little bit later. But anyways, this is Better Investing. This is the website. If you ever want to learn more about us, Better Investing, it's a good place to go. And, and then finally, our mission is creating successful lifelong investors. And that's really been our goal from day one. And um, I think generally that's been a, a pretty successful goal for us. So as I said earlier, um, retirement might not always be a, what you think it's going to be. And the nice pictures everyone shows you is, is maybe a little misleading at times. So I think of retirement a little bit like the woman here screaming on the right, which is it's coming. Um, just the question is, how are you going to deal with it? is going to be how you decide how your retirement will be from a success or a failure or, or fun or less fun, depending on what it might be. Um, but it's coming. So a couple of items from this page I want to share. This is some data in the last uh, five years of where people are. And I think the most important piece from this one for me is, oops, sorry, 
uh, the very top in the bold, that a, um, workers age 55 to 64, median amount saved in their retirement um, or saved was $89,000. Um, that's probably not going to allow you to have the kind of uh, vic- retirement that you saw early on with you know beaches and boating and and, and golfing um it's going to allow you to have some sort of retirement but it might not be that uh additionally i think something important down here is 32 percent of all americans don't have any retirement savings at this point in time those could be young those could be old um older people so you know so reality is a lot of people have not spent much time trying to save and i I'm not trying to make light of it. It's not easy to save money, um, but it is going to, you know, again, title here is retirement is coming. It's not going to stop coming. It's going to keep coming. So you need to figure out how you can make it better for yourself. Then lastly, 42% of Americans have less than $1,000 in liquid savings and 58% have less than $5,000 savings, which means if you have a, all of a sudden a financial crisis, i.e. your car breaks down, you have to go to the hospital. Um, that causes a lot of problems for people's cash flows. And that could be a problem that someone might experience. And that has a big impact eventually uh, on your potential retirement. Now, the last item here for this page before I move on um, is actually something that impacted me as well, is roughly 50% of retirees retired earlier than they expected. So a lot of people say, I'm going to retire at 65. Well, that might not actually happen. Um, you might retire early for either health, a disability, or having to take a care of a, a, a relative that's in your family. Um, and so, you know, it might not actually work out the way. In my case, I had a health event two years earlier than when I planned to retire. Everything came out fine from that, but I did not really enjoy um, the event very well. And it caused me to want to retire early um, because I did not like what I went through. So my point to you is, even though you might have a great plan, it might not happen. Which then gets me into what is retirement reality as far as I am concerned. Uh, Unless you're financially prepared, you should not expect your retirement to be significantly different than how your life has been lived so far. Guarding yourself against unrealistic retirement expectations is crucial, meaning that if you've not done an annual cruise every year with the family uh, on on some one of the cruise ships, well, you probably aren't going to do it in retirement. Um, yeah, even though we see all the commercials showing everyone having fun and going on the cruise ships, doesn't mean you can't do it. Not saying that you still can probably do it. You probably have a bucket list. You can probably do some things on your bucket list. But if you haven't spent your life going overseas and travel every year, well, you might not do it in retirement. So just be aware that you need to have a ha, couch yourself where you think you might be or not be um, from that perspective. Now, can all this, all this can be fixed. Um, you know, that's not an issue. Uh, and the reason how it can be fixed is probably the first and most important bullet point on the left in, 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 in blue, education. Um, if you educate yourself, you will actually have a better understanding of what goes on. I have a folder that sits near me um, in my office that's that's uh, probably has about 500 different articles over the last 15 years about retirement and this and that and the next thing. And, and um, why? I, I've spent my life learning things. I'm also a financial person, so I like to read. But educating yourself would be, is, is very key and important. The second bullet point here, sacrifice. It's a dirty word. I get it. People don't want to sacrifice. But guess what? You might need to sacrifice on occasion to help yourself out to making your goals in the long run. That's something you need to think about. There's also things called planning. This can help. Statistically, we found people that plan in advance tend to have better outcomes. Now, time is something we'll spend more in a little bit, but time also comes over here on the right-hand side. It's the time value of money, and time value of money is important, very important for younger people, and you're going to see that in a little bit. But, you know, these are things you, you, you need to think about, and you can help other generations younger than you to actually get ahead by helping them in the future. Then understanding what your benefits are. Do you have a retirement plan at work? If not, what is it? If you do have one, what is it? How how does it work? Is it just a 401k plan? Do they match you, et cetera, et cetera? What's your social security stuff? Everything is available. You just need to spend the time to go do it. 
But so I don't think anything is broken out there for someone to have a fantastic retirement, but you, it doesn't just get handed to you. So these are two charts that I think are important. On the left is the more basic, bigger picture um, uh, from a high level. And just starts off the top is you, you got to plan what you think life might be like in retirement. You have to do income planning to help you get there over time. You might need some insurance to protect your assets so that you can actually retire. You might want to do some health care planning, depending on how your health is. Um, and then it, maybe or maybe not do some legacy planning. These are just big bullet points. Nothing's really unique or special here. But on the right, we actually get a little more detailed as, as the reality is going towards retirement. How much you save will have a big impact on, number one, your sustainable withdrawal rate, how much you actually need to save on a regular basis, how much your income replacement rate might be. And then your retirement age. All these four things are connected, or five things are, are, are all interconnected with each other. And, and the more you happen to save has a different impact on how much you can pull out and then how much you might have to save in the future. Um, so all these are connected. And as a financial advisor, this is where I spent a lot of my time helping people understand that, oh, they might need to save more if this is what their financial goal is at the end of the day. As a, as a person that teaches on this on this subject on a regular basis, I think understanding the different factors are quite important for people's success. So uh, we'd like you to possibly, if you want, to go put in this chat box um, answers to the questions, or particularly more the second one than the first, is do you feel comfortable with your retirement plans? Yes or no? Easy question. Hard to answer, but easy question. Um, do you feel comfortable with your retirement plan? And the second one is, what is your biggest, biggest retirement concerns? If you would like, put it in the chat box. Please don't give any personal information out. We can't solve your financial situation over a, a webinar. But you know, if you want to share a piece or two, we would appreciate it. Jim's going to be looking at those while I continue on the presentation. So I said the core of this class was on asset allocation, and, and, and this is a, what I determined what asset allocation is, and this description here is quite important. Asset allocation is really just an investment strategy right here that attempts to balance risk versus reward by adjusting how much you have in the portfolio in different risk or risk or less risky assets based on the clients, or the in, in this case, the investors' risk tolerance, their goals, and their investment time frame. And thus, on the very bottom, we just have a very simplistic chart looking at in yellow bonds, in red stocks. And if you're a conservative investor, you have more money in bonds. Why? It tends to be much less volatile. If you happen to be more risky or younger, then we're going to probably have you in more equities why you have a longer term to grow. We're going to spend some time on that in a little bit. But these are just three simple asset allocation charts um, of where people might fit depending on their risk tolerances, their goals, as well as their investment time frame. These three things are really key to determine where you're going to be in retirement later on. And, and very important to think about yourself when you're, as you're going along in life. Now, this slide here is just is, is actually two different pieces thrown together, but it's trying to highlight the importance of asset allocation. And, and I'm going to spend more time on the right because I think this is the more important piece of this. And that basically says that asset allocation is responsible for 90% of the variations of portfolio performance for people, meaning that if I have an all stock portfolio, it's going to act a lot different than an someone that has an all bond or fixed income portfolio. Why those are two different asset classes, they don't react the same, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so based on what someone tells me their risk level could be, based on how much risk they have in their portfolio, will really explain their portfolio performance. If I'm trying to generate a fast return over time, I am probably going to have more equities in there. Why? Because Jim will demonstrate later, equities have produced better returns over the long term. On the left-hand side here, this is a comment by one of the more uh, better-known hedge fund managers in the world, 
Um, he's been very successful over his time frame. Talking about asset allocation, and his opinion is you need to have a balanced, structured portfolio. What structure? That's a, a, a a question mark we could answer try later but having a portfolio that's built in a way that will do well in a number of different environments which means in the very bottom which is probably the most important piece is we have to have a number of diversified investments he says bets i would say investments because yes stock markets are can be considered um like going to a casino but not really. Um, you actually owning assets that can grow over time, hopefully. So, but this is, you know, the real concept is building a portfolio, portfolio that includes different asset classes. They all go together to build a diversified um, thing that will hopefully meet your risk levels from an asset allocation perspective. And this is probably the crux of this last couple of seconds of, of conversation here is having the right asset allocation level during your and working years can help you achieve a better retirement. And I'm going to go into that in a little bit, but meaning that if I'm too conservative during my working years, I might not get enough growth to meet what I need in retirement. On the other hand, if I took maybe way too much risk in different ways, when I maybe didn't need to, that could also have an impact. Then second, the time value of money should lead to investing and to lead you to investing and, and doing it consistently over time. This has also led to people having a better retirement, being a consistent investor, not trying to jump in and jump out of the market on a regular basis has led to probably better performance over time. And I'm going to cover some of these things in the next couple of slides. So as I said earlier, Jim's going to touch on it. I'm also going to touch on this slide here, which just focuses on investment performance. And this is a long-term history. Yes, I get people don't invest necessarily for you know, almost 100 years. But you, know, you should think long-term. And then the green arrow on the left-hand side here just shows you the difference of returns. Stocks wildly outperform bonds, which does significantly better than treasury bills. And then you can see how the charts act over time. These are your stocks up in the upper right, green arrow. The red arrow is bonds and treasury bills. Guess what? You don't make as much money there. But yet, a lot of people will have a lot of their money will be sitting in bonds and and, and and money market funds, even if they're young, when they have a long time towards retirement. So this is what we're, what we in Better Investing would try to get you to think about how to invest for the long term and get these things to grow over time. Most people need to have a decent slug of investments, either in real estate or stocks or both, to get the long-term returns you're going to need. Um, otherwise, you might not have as much money saved. Um, when you need to get to it. But this is probably one of the most important slides, I think. Um, the slide I saw coming out of college of uh, 40 some odd years ago. And, and you, know, it, you know, it led to me to believe that, yes, I need to have money in stocks and I need to have a significant amount of stocks. And guess what? Over time, stocks go up. Unfortunately, there are other times, as you can see here, where the stocks don't necessarily go up for a period of time. But guess what? They go back up and go to new highs after that. So that's the important message from that slide. So here's the comments for the young folks in the in the audience. Um, and everybody in their 401k plans usually will have something that's a target retirement choice out there. In this case, I picked Vanguard's because they're popular. Vanguard target retirement 2065, that's 40 years away from now. Yet having done that, they do have a, and, and then again, Based on what I just shared on the prior slide, I think you should have a very healthy allocation to stocks. Having said that, in 40 years towards retirement, they have 11% of their money sitting in bonds. Now, you just go back to that old chart of the bonds versus stocks. Bonds were significantly less return than stocks. In a 40-year time horizon, that can really impact your return. So my opinion is you should probably have most of your money, if not all your money, in the stock market until you get to a period of time closer to retirement. My opinion is 10 years. Others might have different opinions than that, but that's what a lot of the data would tell you. Now, why the target funds do this, I'm not really sure. 
other than I think they like to show the diversification out there. Um, and there is some benefit from stocks and bonds in the same portfolio, but I will guarantee you, you're giving up some return for that diversification. So my argument is have all your money in stocks until you get within 10 years of your retirement age. And why? Well, time value of money. This is just very simple. If I can get my money growing at a faster rate or at a, at a rate and compounded over time through dividends or reinvesting the principal, it's quite, quite important. And so what I'm going to show you here is that, you know, it's, it's if I start with a $1,000 investment, 10% return for 20 years on, on simple return, Guess what? I get my thousand dollars back in, in in twenty years, and I get a, and I get some interest that gets me up to a total return of almost three thousand dollars. So so that's good. I made money, but if I was able to earn interest on the interest earned throughout that whole time period at that ten percent rate, well, that money goes from three thousand to seven thousand dollars. That's a big difference between those two, and thus that's what we would argue you should at least think about and compounding returns and having a younger person starting earlier to invest will get you better returns over time. Now, so the, so time value of money is very, very important. And, and, and that's what we just touched on. Another thing is being in and out of the market. And I think this slide is just very, I mean, there's basically two points here you really need to focus on. If you're fully invested based on the S&P 500 for, a time period of about 20 years, uh, you got a return about 8%. Pretty darn good. However, if you missed the 10 best days during that 20 years, your return got cut in half. So if you decided at some point, oh, I think the market's going to go down, yet then the market doesn't go down, guess what? You just, you just hurt your return significantly. If you miss the best 60 days, you actually have a negative return. And so People think it's easy to time to get in and get out of the market. I've been doing this for 40 years. My answer to you is no, it's not. It's not very easy at all. Um, and, and and I think the comment here with the green arrows at six of the best 10 days over the time period is within two weeks of the 10 worst days, meaning they tend to happen fairly close to each other. So you have to be really good at getting in and getting out um, and then getting back in again. And I don't think people are that good. Um, like I said, I've been doing this for 40 plus years, and I, I, I don't think that's a realistic concept. Yet, there are some people out there that I think can do it, but it's very few people. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure that they can really do it throughout that whole lifespan. So the, the stock market chart was probably one of the most important charts you're going to see. This is probably the second most important chart from my simple um, thought process. And this just simply... We're going to first deal with a guy in blue here, Chris, who invests five thousand a year from age twenty-five to sixty-five. He invests two hundred thousand dollars. It grows to a little over one point one million dollars. Now, assuming the same returns for each person on a consistent basis, here's the big difference: Susan, who invests for the first ten years, stops. She goes, "I've invested fifty thousand dollars. I'm going to stop." It grew to six hundred and two thousand dollars. And then Bill said, no, I don't want to start investing at 25. I want to go on a trip. I want to go buy a car. I want to go do this. I want to go do that. I'll start when I'm 35, but I'm going to put $5,000 in too, same as, as Susan did, but I'm going to start at 35 and I'll catch up. Well, Bill invests a total of $150,000, so three times as much invested, but still over that next 30 years hasn't caught up with Susan. Uh, so the red arrow has not caught up with the green arrow. It's getting closer. And maybe in another 20 years, it might catch up. But the point is starting early is very, very, very important. Putting money away early is very important. And doing it consistently will help you get a better return over time. Um, so at this point, I'll usually get a comment in the chat that's saying, oh, my gosh, I've missed it. I'm not 25. I'm 60. I'll never be able to do this. This is this. I've missed my opportunity. And at some level, you might have. Doesn't mean you've missed your opportunity for your kids or your grandkids. They might be able to take care of it. But at 65, your time frame to is still 20 
to maybe 30 years based on historical averages. It's a good 20 years based on historical averages. Most people will live another 20 years from age 65. So you still have a long time frame to still put money away and for it to still grow. So you haven't missed it completely. You've just missed the, the, the great opportunity. And unfortunately, the great opportunity to start at 25 and, and go through your life. A lot of young people miss it too because they don't aren't aware of it, aren't knowledgeable enough about it, and don't really understand it yet. And, and so a lot of people do miss out, unfortunately. And they do start at 35 and they still do just fine, but they don't make as much as if you could have started earlier on. So we'll touch a little bit more on this a little bit later. But this is a very important slide. Starting early and often is, is the best way to go. Um, starting at all is number one probably the most important thing you do have to start if you want to have a better retirement down the road so some key items to think about um the first one here how much money will you need in retirement that's really just a lifestyle question how are you going to lead live your retirement are you going to go on a international trip every year or are you going to uh, stay at the nicest hotels in the united states when you travel that's your question you need to decide how you're going to or are you going to go to the campgrounds or whatever it might be you need to figure out what it is, but it's your lifestyle question. Um, what's your debt plan in retirement? Are you going to have it all gone or are you going to still have it? Now, reality is for a lot of people today, unlike 30 years ago, most people paid off their debts before they went into retirement. Today, that's not the tra case. Many people now go into retirement with some sort of debt. I will argue it makes it harder um, at some level, but sometimes it makes a lot of sense. If you have a home mortgage at 2% mortgage with rates at 7 8% now, I would argue I'd probably keep the mortgage. Um, but it comes down to cash flow because in, in, in retirement, it, it it's, the real key is how much cash do you have to pay your bills now? Um, and that's really what you need to think about when you're in retirement. But these are other very important questions. When will you retire? How much flexibility might you have? You're going to hear flexibility quite a bit from us. We think that's quite important. Um, how much you already have saved, how much you're putting away. If you're a younger person, aim for 15 to 20%. There have been some recent studies that I've seen saying people at a 15% savings rate is are, are having significantly higher success of getting enough money for their retirement plans down the road. Then there's something called spending leaks. This is how people can be more successful in saving. All of us have them. Trust me. I know everyone has one. Um, uh, and mine was very simple when I was working in an office in San Francisco of I would never bring a lunch to work. Um, I would always go out for lunch. Well, that gets expensive. Uh, I was doing well enough that said I could do afford to do that. So I did it. But most people shouldn't do that. They should probably save enough money uh, by bringing their lunch with them on a regular basis. Other spending leaks. If you go to Starbucks every day, well, that's fine. It's your choice. I like Starbucks. I, I you know, I've been a long-term investor with Starbucks for 25 years. But you are spending a lot of money every day that you could maybe put it aside someplace else. These are considered spending leaks, and there's lots of others out there. The, if you sat down and thought about it, do I really need three or four streaming services? Well, maybe I can get by with one or two. Then lastly, this is probably the other easy area that people could do to help themselves out, unexpected windfalls. Let's say you get a bonus or a tax refund. Well, try to save a portion of that for your future. Put it away um, and, and let that grow as an investment. Those are probably the other ways. Or use it to pay off debts if you have to have some real high interest debts out there. But those are ways you can think about trying to do things to help yourself get more money to be with you down the road. Lastly, and this is probably an important piece, and, and this is something that younger people can definitely do, um, harder to get to get some of these things done. But start thinking about building unearned income streams, meaning during your lifetime, building these streams of income that will be there earning something for you when you have decided to step away from your full-time job. And that can be rental real estate. Obviously, that takes money to go buy a piece of real estate. Um, something I've been reading about, I've never done it. I don't know that much about it. But some people argue vending machines is a, maybe a way that you can 
own an asset that will generate income. I'm not 100% sure that works as well as everyone thinks it does, but maybe it does. Um, I've never done it, but I've read about it and it let to, does require less capital. But there's two here right, right here, and dividend income from stocks and interest income from bonds. Once you buy the security, it just generates income for you, assuming they continue to pay their dividends and interest. Um, if they don't, you'll have a problem there. Um, but those are when you put some money in a portfolio that can generate income, will be giving you income for a long time to come, hopefully. Lastly, you might have an ownership in a business. You could either sell that or you could, you know, require maybe hopefully work less in that business and and be able to generate cash flow from that. But this is how you build unearned in, un earned income streams, not an easy statement to say, um, but building future income streams that will hopefully continue on during your retirement days. Um, these are very important ways to help build your future. So I mentioned dividends and stocks. I, since we are with better investing, I'll, I'll, one last slide on stocks for, for me is this is owning a dividend stream. And these are dividends from stocks. And this chart is basically trying to show you the very top line with a green arrow next to it is dividend growers. So these are companies that pay a dividend and grow their dividend each year. And those have done much better than the stock market. Um, and this is the stock market. Uh, over this whole time frame, which is a long, which is a long time period, but just be aware, they have done well. Um, but you also get an income stream. Now, I'll guarantee you, the income from these securities is not very high, but they grow on a pretty consistent basis because that's what their growth is really. That's what the goal of those companies are to do. Lastly, on this slide is this red arrow, which says if you have a company that's going to cut its dividend or is, is thinking about or worried about doing that, um, it's very bad for your valuation, for your stock, and for your ownership. So try to avoid companies that are paying too high of a dividend yield that could end up cutting it. Uh, it's usually not good for your financial wealth over time. But we have found, and this chart demonstrates over 50 some odd years, dividend growers do pretty well. With that, I'm going to stop. I'm going to turn over to Jim if he has any comments from the earlier question that we answered. Then we'll see if Jonathan has a couple of questions for us. Oh, uh, I see a couple of questions. Uh, I just want to remind people we can't recommend anything. Someone had a question about um, high yield savings accounts that we would recommend that are legitimate and safe. Uh, all I can say is, you know, go with a, a CD offer that has been around, and you know, a well-known bank, et cetera. And bear in mind, the higher the, the payment, the lower, uh, I mean, the higher the payment, the higher the risk. But also, if you're with uh, a bank, they're insured to a certain extent. But basically, if you do some research, you'll find that there's a large majority of them that pay roughly the same amount. And I just say be a little bit leery of someone who's much higher or much lower. Someone had a question about calculating what your retirement savings will be when you get there. There's something called the rule of 72, which is a helpful rule of thumb. What it says is in, you take the interest rate that you are earning or expect to earn, and you divide it into 72. So if you're getting 7% interest, uh, it goes into 72 10 times, a little more. That means your money if you you know compound the interest if you don't take it out your money will double in 10 years if you're getting 7% uh 5% interest 5 goes into 72 about 14 times and change so it'll take 14 years for your money to double and that's shown in the chart that Craig just went through about uh, dividends where the dividends increase because the value of compounding you know, works in your favor over time. So, Jim, did we get any uh, comments about biggest retirement concerns? Um, 
and where most people say, comfortable. How to contribute uh, to it consistently and invest the money so it grows. Uh, consistently is up to the individual. We recommend it. Do it. Um, if you don't do it, you're in trouble because you're losing value uh, from not being consistent. You're not compounding uh, the and earnings on your investment, but everyone works in different ways. Uh, if you have a uh, 401k at work and the boss will match, do your level best to put in to get the maximum match. That's simply free money. And you say, well, that's obvious, but I know people who don't do it. Okay. So try and be consistent. You know, put it, the easiest way to save is to not get it into your hands. Uh, the 401k comes out of your paycheck and you don't really miss it. That's why the government takes withholding for income taxes out of your paycheck. If you had to pay your taxes all on April 15, a lot of us couldn't. Uh, but if it's out of sight, out of mind. If you have a piggy bank, and I still have one. Yeah, put your spare change in the piggy bank. You don't have any spare change, put a buck or two in the piggy bank. But then don't spend it. Uh, I've done that all my life, and then go bank the proceeds. Teach your kids. If you your kids get a, a check from Auntie Jane for their birthday, you know, suggest to them that they save part of it. We're not talking retirement for a 10-year-old, but we are trying to teach saving habits. And then good habits will hopefully continue in your saving for retirement. So with that... Uh, one, one last question, Jim. Did, did most people feel comfortable with their retirement plans? We got yes and no. Uh, okay. Not too many replies. Okay. Um, one person is retired comfortably. He's attending today to check for other tips. Hopefully we can give him a couple. There you go. One, I'd like to understand how to do a sustainable withdrawal. That's coming up. Fully enjoying my retirement, planned early, and so far worked out great. The key to That's that awesome. person, planned early. There you if go. If you haven't planned early, well, it's time to start. Uh, okay. Um, concern they haven't contributed enough. Well, we'll talk about that because there's uh, still time. No matter how old you are, there's still time, and hopefully you can be flexible, which is key. Okay, uh, Jonathan. Anything you saw in the questions that we need to answer before we move on? Um, let's see. So there was one question. I believe this was in reference to um, the percentage that should be saved each year um, someone asked is it a percent of income before or after taxes before taxes okay and if you save it by putting in a 401k or an ira within all the rules and regulations and limits you don't pay taxes on it. correct so that's another uh, key issue sometimes people forget that um, okay, there's uh, a question. I think this is about uh, risk tolerance. Um, it says we're in our mid 40s. We are interested in investing in AI companies that are not public yet. What percentage of our income do you think is quote unquote safe to invest in this risky move? Uh, way too specific. Um, uh, as to AI companies, I'm not sure why you want to focus just on AI companies. I think you want to build a broad basket of stocks uh, using a thing, you know, whether an index fund or something. Uh, so anyways, from that perspective, that's one thing. And if you're asking how much you should risk in a really risky venture, uh, I think you ask yourself how much are you willing to lose and will it impact your lifestyle? Um, because that's really the answer to your, to your question is if I, you know, it's different for every person. Um, some people can afford to invest $10,000 if they are long time horizon. Yes. 20 years, for, a 40 year old has a long term time, time to get to retirement, but how much do you want to risk in doing that? Um, to me, each, each person is different. Each person has risk levels they might or might not want. Um, 
to take that risk level. And so it, it's really, there's not a generic answer for that one from my perspective. Um, but, you know, you know, you, you don't always focus on what's the hottest thing in Wall Street, because that's usually not a great way to invest in the long term, based on my 40 years. So. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, continue then. Um, there was um, another question about how do you find companies that pay dividends? Uh, lots of different ways. Um, uh, most companies will announce if they're paying a dividend. Uh, there's lots of different comp uh, strategies or indexes out there that focus on dividend paying companies. Uh, so it, it, that's not very hard to go do. Um, and uh, if someone wants to put a note, I can, there's lots of different ways to find companies that pay dividends. So just do a Google search on dividend paying companies and you'll find many, many resources out there. Uh, there are lists called dividend aristocrats and the companies that have paid a dividend for 25 years without missing a beat and such. One point, dividends tend to be paid by larger, more stable companies, and the dividend income is usually pretty stable. But large, big, stable companies don't tend to grow as fast as smaller, more nimble companies. So right there, if you get a dividend stock, you've already made a implicit decision on risk reward there you go less risk uh but less reward so that's uh nothing wrong with dividend stocks uh i have some uh, portfolio they've done very well it's a more conservative investment than investing in smaller companies or even some etfs excuse me exchange traded funds or mutual funds that focus in different areas. Okay. Um, need to go move on due to time. Uh, we'll answer more questions later. So thank you, Jim and Jonathan, for offering some questions. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jim, to start moving forward. A range of rolling returns. Uh, this chart needs a bit of explanation. If you look at the red box on the left, uh, this uh, shows you that in in uh, any given year, the stock portfolio or has, could go up as much as 47% or down as much as 39%. The middle column, brown, a blended stocks and bonds might go up as much as 43 or down minus eight. And the purple, which is 50-50, might go up 33 and down 15. Those, uh, that's called volatility. And it's kind of scary to think that your retirement fund might go down 39% in one year. Uh, things similar to that happened in 2008, and there are ways to get around that. But the five-year rolling return, the, uh, the first set of numbers in the green box, shows that over time, the range of up and down is much less. You look at 10 years rolling, uh, it's much less, and only one of the investment types has a negative return. And then over 20 years, which hopefully is uh, a minimum retirement uh, horizon, oh, stocks went up as much as 17% and down as much as up 7%. If this is shows the impact of leaving your money in the stock market and the bonds over time. In any given year, things can go tops and turvy and do. Uh, look at 2008. You know, I retired at the, the end of 2004, so that came pretty early on in my retirement, uh, but we were able to work around it without any real problems. Uh, and the whole point here is, over the long term, this is what these portfolios are going to do. Based on history, we have no reason to believe that the future will be markedly different from the past. So, next. Flexibility. Uh, you have to be willing to change. Uh, as I mentioned, the 2008 and we'll get to another slide which shows that in a very dramatic form called the retirement smile. 
Well, how do you maintain flexibility? One reason, one way to do it is to be flexible about your needs. Uh, sometimes that's uh, mandatory. My wife and I had a cruise booked for 2020, and uh, along came the pandemic, and it canceled it. Saved us a bunch of money. Maybe a good idea. But when you get to 10 years away from retirement, you're losing flexibility. You can't work harder. You can't take more overtime. Maybe you can't take on a second job. How can you be flexible? 10 years away from retirement, you're, what, 55? Uh, hopefully, the kids are gone. Uh, you don't have any college debt. Uh, you built up uh, a lot of goods and things you aren't running out and, and buying new stuff all the time and your life is somewhat settled good time to really key in on retirement hopefully you've been doing it since age 25 but when it's 10 years away you have to get more serious you control your needs you control your spending you don't have to go to starbucks twice a day you can brown bag it one thing I did when working is I always drank water with lunch instead of a soda and or iced tea. Over time, three or four bucks a day, five days a week, 50 weeks a year, that's a significant chunk of money. If you have the wherewithal to do that and put it in the bank, you're that much ahead. Um, debt, uh, Craig touched on this. That's a very individual subject. It depends on your whole financial picture. And if there's one thing that you take away from today's presentation is that everyone is different. What's good for this person in retirement planning is not necessarily good for the next person. What works for one person doesn't necessarily work for the next person. So it's all individual and all the rules that we might talk about, there are lots of exceptions. And the bottom line is age 55 or 10 years before you want to retire, might be 50. What are your assets and what are your needs? Well, your assets, you can probably you know, figure out, at least generally speaking, in very short order. What about your needs? Now, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so now we're up to five years away from retirement, and as the slide suggests, fine-tune your plan. Start becoming more conservative. If the market tends to go down, or does go down, how much can you afford for it to go down? So maybe you get more bonds, more fixed income. Uh, because this time, you don't have much. you got five years left to save for retirement. That's not a terribly long time, but it's not in short. You might have to work longer if you can. Um, saving more than your goal gives you more flexibility in retirement. So let's assume you want to retire with uh, uh, an income of $100,000. What if you uh, save more? And then when you retire, you find, oh, you know, we don't really even need 100,000, 90 will do. Well, you have flexibility. Or if you need 110,000, well, you've saved a little extra. So, okay, you can continue with your plans. And then finally, is everyone on the same page? And that means everyone who is in your estate plan, your retirement plan, your spouse, your, your partner, uh, do you have uh, re responsibilities, dependents, uh, old or young, that will still be dependent on you in retirement? But when I said earlier, uh, you control your needs, how do you estimate your needs? That means you sit down with your spouse or your partner and say, what do you want in retirement? How do you want to live? What do you want to do? What are we going to need? 
And then you have to do the what if scenario. What if one of us gets sick? One, uh, what if, what if, what if? Think about it. Uh, and then say, oh, that might happen. Well, plan on it. How, what are you going to do if that does happen? If the boss comes in when you're 63 and says you're redundant, uh, so be gone by uh, 11 o'clock and it's been nice knowing you. Um, that happened to uh, two, uh, my, one brother-in-law and my brother, both very successful senior in their companies and became redundant in 24 hours. Next slide. Okay. What do people worry about in retirement the most? I think, as the slide says, running out. What if I run out of money? And um, unless you have an awful lot of money or have resources that are you know, very substantial, it's a risk that you have to worry about. The problem is we don't have a crystal ball. And this, this top chart shows uh, what happens in two scenarios. You retire and you have an, you're planning retirement. You have an assumed annual rate of return of 8%. Well, if you look at the top line, you start with a million dollars. Oh, great. That's fine. You know, you're withdrawing and it says it's a 5.4% withdrawal. And at age 92, you're still going to have plenty of money. You're going to have almost the entire million dollars left. But reality is not average. If you take what really happened during that time period, uh, looking down at the bottom half of the page, you can see in the first year, you had a loss in your portfolio, and then you had small gains the next couple of years, and then a bigger loss, then an average gain or expected gain, and then a bigger than one. Oh, my. Well, that's life. Now, what's interesting is the actual return average was 9.1% or higher than the 8%. But since our hypothetical person here lost a lot of money in the first few years. They just kind of sank downhill and they ran out of money when they were about 84 years old. The only purpose of this is don't rely on averages. You know, averages uh, aren't real life. You have to rely on them a little bit or you go crazy, but they are not reality. So you have to assume sometimes be pessimistic and assume that you know, something bad will happen. The market will go down. You'll have to retire earlier. You'll have a significant medical problem. Um, next slide. One person asked in the chat box, uh, how much can I take out of my retirement plan? This rule of thumb, and again, it's different for everyone. This is simply basically an example. It suggests you can take 4% out of your retirement fund in the first year and then increase it each year by inflation. And then there's an example. You have a million dollars in your retirement fund. 4% rule says you take out 40,000 a year, add social security, pension, annuity benefits, and come up with a total of what your income will be. And then you sit down, well, what are we going to be needing to spend? Uh, here's where debt management comes in because we're talking cash flow. Your cash flow or your income after you retire is whatever it is. Uh, and if you can't change that, then you have to change your spending needs or get cash from some other place. Now, 4%, there's another slide that says you can assume 6.7 you know, or 8% return on a, a decent stock portfolio. Again, 
Life ain't average. Reality is not average. And that's why this rule of thumb is probably down at the 4% range. So finally, it says, if your needs are not met, increase your assets. Well, this is good advice now because we're still planning. Uh, we're not there yet. Or trim your needs. Uh, maybe, you know, not buy a new car this year, but, you know, keep old Bessie running for another two years. Or change your retirement date if you can. Maybe work another couple of years. Or what happened in my family is when I retired, my wife evidently thought about having me at home all the time, and she went out and got a job and worked for the next four years before she retired. And that was very helpful to our retirement. Not suggesting that you uh, suggest that to your spouse or partner, but it is a way that you can increase your assets. Next page. Social security, as Craig pointed out earlier, people live longer. And as I just pointed out, life ain't average. And there are retirement income calculators that will tell you how much you can expect in social security uh, once you figure out what your... Uh, Payments have been into Social Security. I think Social Security has a calculator and you can actually get access to your records. But the question is, how certain are Social Security benefits? I've been reading most of my adult life about how Social Security is going to run out of money and Medicare is going to run out of money. And so far, they haven't. But it gets more... Get, it's more serious, and the politicians keep kicking the can down the road. So a suggestion is uh, Social Security benefits may not be what you plan them to be. Even though you get all your information and do get the calculations done, it may not be there, or it may not be there if you earn uh, more than a certain amount of money from your retirement plan or outside income. Just a caution. The next slide will talk about when to take Social Security. Everyone and his uncle has an opinion on this. And what I want to say is it's up to you. You're an individual. Things you have to take into account are... How much do I get if I retire as soon as possible, full retirement age, or age 70? It will be a different amount. I'm not going into the, the differing amounts. <clears throat> Next question is, very blunt, how long do you think you're going to live? Because at some point, taking benefits early gives you the same amount of money as uh, taking waiting and taking bigger benefits later. If you're retiring at 65 and your family is short-lived and you have a history of illness and a family history of significant diseases, you have to be realistic. Overall, though, it's we think it's a good idea to base your plan on retiring at full retirement age. Yes, if you live to be 90, you'll get more money, as this chart says, by waiting till 70. Uh, and you'll get, but if you retire at full retirement age, you get more money than if you claim at 62. But if you look at age 80, the figures aren't that much different in terms of the total benefits. Someone who retired at 62 has got 623,000 someone who waited for retirement age has got another 66,000 and someone who waited till age 70 has got another 77,000 but the person who retired at 62 has had money in his pocket so to speak for a longer period of time so for social security uh 
It's all individual. And as we'll point out later, it's a good idea to get more than one opinion uh, in addition to your own. Next is uh, figuring out how much you will need. Maybe we should have put this slide earlier. So the question is, well, how do you do this? Estimate how much you'll spend in retirement. How do you do this? Well, you start by figuring out what are you spending now? As Craig mentioned early on, you're not going to live much differently in retirement for most of us than you do right now. Uh, there may be significant differences in that you don't have uh, any dependents and you may not have a mortgage. But sit down with your monthly expenses and, okay, we're spending X dollars a month. Well, what expenses are going to go away when you retire? Well, if you commute to work, okay, you won't have the commuting expense and all the glorious tolls that we pay in the Bay Area. You won't have uh, eating out. Uh, you may save on your wardrobe by not having to buy uh, business clothes. Uh, and then what expenses are going to go up because you're not working? Um, maybe medical if you're retiring before you're eligible for Medicare. Don't forget that. Uh, and maybe staying at home, uh, maybe you're the type of person who will spend more money uh, staying at home because you get involved in uh, a hobby that uh, you've never had time to indulge in and you start spending money on the hobby. Uh, playing golf comes to mind. I used to play golf regularly once a year. Uh, it's expensive. If you start playing once a week, twice a month. And then there are the unexpected expenses. You get a wedding invitation in the mail for your favorite niece. Well, are you going to go? Where is it? Oops, it's a destination wedding. Uh, other trips, vacations. And then finally, a big one. Are you going to stay or are you going to move? If you live in a big house, are you going to sell it and downsize? That has all sorts of financial implications that we can't get into, but it's something you need to think about. So calculating what you will collect in retirement from pensions and Social Security. If you're going to get a pension, great. Uh, go to your HR department and ask them, how much? What, what will I get? They should be able to give you uh, not an exact answer necessarily, but a pretty good estimate. Social Security, you can go through Social Security, or at least you used to be able to, and figure out what your benefits will be if you retire at age X. That assumes that you've paid in your uh, 40 quarters uh, necessary for full eligibility, if indeed that's still the rule. So once you, you've figured out what you need, then you go back and say, well, what are we going to have? If they meet, huh, your plan seems to be on side. If you need more retirement, you're going to have to do something to either make it up or figure out a way to live on less money. Next slide. This is the retirement smile. Yeah, we've just been saying your your needs are going to be different in retirement. Your desires as to what you do are going to be different in retirement. And some, uh, Christine Benz did a study on this, and this shows someone with $100,000 to spend every year. That's the black line at the top, but the gray line shows what they actually spent. And it started out, and then it went, you know, went down, and then it went uh, hit a nadir at about age 83, and then started going back up again. And the reasons for this are quite simple. As you get older, uh, you become less capable. You tend to stick closer to home. This is a lot of us, not all of us. And you just don't spend as much. Uh, 
myself as an example, I find that I spend very little on clothes. I go around in jeans and an old shirt because I'm usually out working in the garden. Uh, other expenses go down. Maybe you don't eat out as much. But then as you get older, then your expenses go back up, primarily medical. Uh, we know retirement's coming. Some of us try to avoid it. And the same thing holds true for getting old. Uh, they haven't yet figured out a way to stop it. So we're all going to get old, and we're not immune from running into the various problems that come with getting old. Uh, next, some more rules of thumb. Remember, you're an individual. You're different. Take these with a grain of salt. So studies have shown 70 to 80% of your pre-retirement yearly salary to live comfortably. And that assumes house is paid off and assumes an average income person. If you happen to be a person who's earning a very good salary now, uh, you and having just gone through tax season, you know that you pay an awful lot in income taxes. Well, that's a big difference when you go to a retirement income that's substantially less. Uh, the taxes just drop dramatically. That's one nice thing. So it's individual. Do you want to travel? Well, what's your idea of traveling? A friend of mine just said he was going on vacation for a month. Well, he has an RV and he's going to go up north and camp in his RV for a month. That's not the same thing as taking a trip over to Europe for four weeks on a cruise ship or fly and drive. And then aim this rule of thumb aim to have saved at least one times your salary at age 30 three times at 40 and so on 10 times at 67 i would um, take that rule with several grains of salt i think it's on the low side but it's a rule of thumb then the final bullet, the 25X rule, estimates how much money you'll need in retirement. This is simply the reverse of the 4% uh, withdrawal rate. It says, you know, if you need $40,000, you multiply by 25, and you've got to have a million dollars invested to enable you to withdraw $40,000 a year at 4%. But the, the rules, they can be helpful these rules of thumb, but they're not the Bible. Just keep remembering that you're unique. And with the next slide, we get to some really important things. Emergency fund. That's been preached for decades, and a lot of people don't have it. Even in retirement, it's a good idea to have six months worth of income in an emergency fund. Doesn't mean it's not invested. Right now, you can get 5% in a money market fund and you can get your hands on the money in a day. Some of them you need and even write checks on the money market fund. So just having a fund doesn't mean that you can't be earning income on it. Pay yourself first. This is early retirement, and the emergency fund rule is also early because you don't want to stop your retirement investments because you have an emergency. Retirement should come first. Then pay yourself first. That means get it into the bank, into an investment before you get your hands on it, either through 401k, IRA. Uh, your bank will cheerfully yank money out of your checking account on a routine basis and put it in a savings account. Well, savings account don't pay much, so then you yank it out of the savings account and invest it also on a routine basis. Uh, then the uh, rate of return, average of 7 to 8% per year. That's another rule of thumb, really. Uh, in my experience, 
that's realistic. Uh, fortunately, I have done better than that, but uh, I don't think it was due to my brilliance, but more to the economy in the last 20 years. Finally, be flexible with your retirement plan. You may get to retirement and think that you want to do X, and after six weeks or six months of doing X, you say, oh, man, I'm bored. I want to do something else. I'm not suggesting you'll take up you know, skydiving or, you know, uh, motorcycles, but be prepared that you, you may change your mind about how you're going to live uh, after you retire. Flexibility is key. And with that, mistakes. Not getting the maximum match from your 401k plan, that's uh, just giving up free money. Uh, if you have an IRA that you need to roll over, don't miss the deadline. It costs you money. Uh, for those of you that uh, have this situation, if you leave an X, or if you don't look at your beneficiary forms on your IRA 401k, you may wind up giving the money to someone you really don't want to give it to. Uh, Ignoring a spousal right to a 401k, yeah, in California, we're community property, so you may think it's all yours, but it's not. Uh, neglecting to name a contingent beneficiary, again, so most of us that were married, you know, you, you get the financial plan, oh yeah, my spouse is the beneficiary. What about a contingent? Because if your spouse predeceases you, and then when you go, there are hassles and costs and expenses. Uh, for those of you already retired, not taking a required minimum distribution from an IRA, penalties. The next one, though, is important. Dipping into retirement savings comes with a heavy cost and consequences. That is so true. And a lot of people don't think about it. They, oh, emergency, I need money, I'll borrow from my retirement savings. Don't, just put it out of your mind. And then for those people more for the last 20 years that uh, change jobs, they'll have a 401k, but they've only been at the job for two years, and there's really not that much money in it. They cash it out, 40% of them. You just, you know, gutted your retirement plan. You took money out. And then finally, a second opinion. And you can get a second opinion from a financial analyst. You can get it from your stockbroker if you have one. You can get it from uh, your third cousin who lives in wherever. Uh but it's a good idea to get second opinions and third opinions. You may be missing something or you may simply uh, have a mindset that is ignoring a couple of very realistic factors. And with that, we'll go back to uh, questions. Great. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate your presentation. Um, Jonathan, do we have time? I think we have time for about one question. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Anything out there? Um, I think this is a good one. Um, how do you factor, um, like, how much money you're going to need during um, inflation times, recession, recessions? Like, I, I think it comes down to the timing of of retirement. Like, how do you how do you factor in the uncertainty there? Well, I think it goes back to Jim's comment about flexibility. Uh, I think you need to plan for inflation um, and, you know, that inflation could be higher than what you originally thought it was going to be. So planning to have uh, budgeting some amount for inflation would be key. As to recessions, recessions also usually are accompanied by a stock market to have gone down. Again, flexibility might say, maybe I'll end up working for another year if I have that luxury to decide to do that or not and postpone my retirement maybe for another year or so um 
again, the whole point that I think both Jim and I were trying to share from the beginning is, 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 is <clears throat> yes, here's a date you want to say, I'm going to retire, but maybe I might be flexible on doing this or doing that. Um, and my assets and my financials might allow me to, or maybe doesn't allow me to. So that's, that's probably how I would probably first address it. Jim, do you have any comments about inf investing or retiring and budgeting for inflationary times? Um, well, I always assume that the government is understating inflation. Um, I know from history that uh, inflation goes up and down. People now are screaming about 7% mortgages. Well, in the mid 80s, when we were adding on to our home and uh, had a construction loan at prime plus three percent. Our interest rate got up to twenty-two percent. So, you know, a seven percent mortgage in those days was better than gold encrusted with diamonds. Things change. We've had a period of very low interest rates and relatively low inflation. Uh, I would assume on the high side, but then again. You have to think, how does inflation touch you? A big part of inflation is housing. If you own your home, that is not our interest rates. Uh, if you own your home, don't have a mortgage, and don't need a mortgage, the impact of inflation on mortgage rates, raising the doubling them, which is a huge amount, doesn't impact you. So you have to look behind the percentage number. Uh, someone asked about uh, moving into uh, assisted living, things like that. Um, two thoughts. One, long-term care insurance. And uh, secondly, uh, it just happened to someone I know, uh, came upon kind of suddenly, um, they sold their home and that gave them the wherewithal to move into the assisted living facility. But yeah, those are very expensive. And it does happen. Look at your parents. You know, how did they, what was their end of life? Look at your relatives. You know, my mother happened to spend the last five years of her life in an uh, assisted living facility. And yeah, and she lived to be 94, so she was healthy. Planning, planning, planning. Yes, it may happen to you. You are not bulletproof. Uh, what can you do about it? Long-term care insurance uh, or setting aside additional money for expected medical problems. And of course, if you retire early, be very careful how you're going to be medically insured before Medicare kicks in. Uh, if your spouse or partners working, can you get on their insurance? Uh, if not, can you get COBRA insurance? It's complicated, but you, I would recommend very strongly, don't permit a gap in medical insurance between the time you retire and the time you're eligible for Medicare. That is correct. I would Invitation agree. Uh, for disaster. I would agree completely. Um, thank you for your comments on that, Jim. Uh, we need to get moving on because we're running late. Um, I'm going to change the topic here from it's not all about money is 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 and, and jump into uh, how you're going to spend your time, how you're thinking. Now, Jim has talked about a lot of that time. He spends his time in the gardens. Uh, other people like getting out and being active and and you know uh, doing other kinds of things. But on the this is really how are you going to spend your time? It's the biggest question as an advisor I do with my clients is, is how are they going to spend their time in retirement? It might be because they need to work. Um, for some people, it's they're going to have to work because they need to cover insurance. As just, Jim just mentioned, lose, having a gap in health care insurance is, is a very big risk. Um, do not take that risk if you can avoid it. Um, but, you know, some people need to work. Others want to work because they want to stay active. They want to they like keeping busy throughout the day um, or, or something else or starting to do something new in their life, as Jim already touched on, it might be uh, just doing different things that they never had a chance in their life prior to go do. But spending time um, is important and having a plan for it, I think is very key. Um, some of the things you might wanna think about uh, when you are 
um, retired, you know, maintaining your health. So that might be through an exercise program or something. Working, getting better relationships with all families and friends, get, getting together with everybody. Um, others go down the direction of spiritual fulfillment. Others start doing hobbies and passions that they've had all they want to do all their life. Um, and so each person is different. Each person is going to figure out what they want to do. But you should have some idea what it's going to look like before you retire. That's my personal opinion. Um, and working out that in advance, I think, is quite important. Um, retirement might not go according to your plan. A recession could happen, as someone asked earlier. Yes, if a recession happens, you might want to shift on your plan. You might try to postpone it a little bit or take a job in between. Who knows? I mean, a part-time job of some sort. You could lose significant wealth. The market could go down a whole bunch. Well, maybe you want to step away for a little bit of you know, time, but maybe you should work a little bit longer while you go through this recession. Um, or you've lost some wealth out there. Put your own situation ahead of others. Well, that's just simply, um, you need to think about your retirement plan before you can think about helping somebody else in the family to go help in their future financial goals, i.e. they want to go buy a house and they want to borrow your retirement money to go buy a house or, or some version of that. You need to think about helping yourself out first so that you can be sure you have a good retirement plan and success and that you might be able to then help them down the road. Uh, reality is you might lose your health. So plans might not work out exactly. And, and I think probably the most important is half a million. I mean, this is actually, uh, I, we, I know someone personally has gone through this. Half a million grandparents, age 65, are raising their grandchildren. I can guarantee you that was not part of their plan when they thought about going into retirement. So you have to be some flex, have some flexibility out there. Um, you know, life changes. Before retirement, um, let's review again. Review and prioritize. Pri prioritize your goals and needs, Char characterize them. You control your costs. Well, maybe I don't need to go spend money over here. Maybe I do need to spend money over there. Timing can change or the amount you want need can change. So if you can postpone things, maybe that works out for you. Or maybe I don't need to buy X, I can buy Y instead. Consider trying to build unearned income streams, things that will generate income for you where you're not having to do much to generate that cash flow. That's a good thing. Understand what you're going to get from Social Security, pensions, and annuities. And, and then finally, put all the numbers together. And I know there was one question out there that I saw about a 10-year, why did we pick 10 years to why you should take stocks? And yes, I, once you get past that 10-year window, you should start becoming more conservative. You know, if you have 10 years or less towards where you think you're going to retire, you want to be more conservative. Why that 10-year window? It's that slide Jim went to in his first one of his first slides where he had the red box and the green box. And what we can see over 10 years is that historically, going back over a lot, a lot of years, a 10-year rolling period, your returns are basically, the worst is they're basically flat. The best is they could be up almost 20% per year. And so you know what you're going to have with a 10-year window, and you don't have the option to make it all back between then and retirement later on. So that that would be the question, why, why is 10 years so important? And there's been some more recent studies being done about that number, and that's starting to get more efficacy raised by the academics out there. So I'm hoping that we'll see more about that. So what can you do next? Well, I think you, you think about how far you are away from retiring. Where do you stand financially? Think about what if questions. Also, think about risk assets. Real estate and stocks tend to be the most common risk assets people use to try to grow their net worth. Um, I think both of them are pretty good. The data would suggest on stocks, um, suggest equities could be a good way to go over the long run. Better investing, we spend our time looking at the stock market. So I'm going to spend a couple seconds here at the end here just talking about how we can maybe help you over time. And one of them in better investing is we do offer free information out there. We're a nonprofit organization, um, and, and and but they do sell asset, sell services out there. But if you go to our website, and on each slide is betterinvesting.org is the website, there has been a box called Open House. They're changing that here real soon, so that might not be there, but we offer our resources. All you need to do is give us your email address, 
there's no credit cards involved. There's no financing. They're going to show you what we have, and then you can decide if you want to or not want to go ahead with that. Um, but educate yourself. We're very big as a group to, trying to you to get better educated. We think the tools that are out there are very common sense. We've been building these over the last 70 years. On the top here is what, how we value our companies that we watch. On the right here is a magazine that you comes every month, which we think is quite good. And then this is the website for support and your community. Um, and there's lots of information out there. Now, Jim and I both are members of the same club. I'm involved in a couple of other clubs. I think clubs are a great way for people to learn how to invest and do it in a safe and supportive environment and, and, and use a piece of your money to do this. Um, and together, I think we can do more. Better Investing has four key uh, ideas and, and how to do this. One is investing regularly. Second is reinvesting those income that comes into the account. Buy high quality growth companies and diversify over time. We do believe very clearly, and we can see this in our own club, um, successful stock investing is possible for everyone by far. Um, and, and this is not something that we, we think is a, a pretty rare event. We see this pretty consistently in clubs. So how can you do this going forward? Well, there's two groups, two ways of kind of doing it. There's something called a visit a club, and then there's a San Francisco Model Club. Jim and I are part of the San Francisco Model Club. And so we are open to the public. We meet on the second Thursday of every month at 545. The next one is on um, May 9th at 545. Uh, email us down below and we can send you a link um, or you can, I think you can get a link online. You can also go to our Better Investing website and go visit a club. There's a number of clubs where you can just go visit and see how they operate and what they do. And there's, I think, five or six clubs out there that are open to the public. And, 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 and you know, if you want to join one, they might be in, up to joining. And that's a way for you to help yourself become better other ways to do this, again, the Visit a Club program here is on that website. Here's the link to it. There's also a new program they just started at Better Investing, which is how to join one. And you put your name in the information. They match it up with a club that's looking for somebody. And then they try to connect the two together. And that's called uh, Investment Club Connect. Or you can go visit a club. There's some very good clubs that I, I, I have known about for years and visited with them um, as a member, as a, as a volunteer. And uh, I think there's lots of good ways. And again, both Jim and I think club investing is a good way to get educated. Uh, and that's really the important piece. Um, yeah, building an education bucket is important for people to do. Um, having success in retirement, there's planning involved. Let's be clear. Uh, flexibility is also something that's quite important. And guess what? Retirement will happen whether you like it or not. It will. It might happen. And depending on how you want to spend your life in retirement will be key. For some people, that is still working, but it's doing a job that they don't feel is really work. Um, uh, so that's, that's reality out there. Try to build various income streams. If you can understand what your assets are, understand your social security and retirement benefits, and, and then understand how much you're going to actually want to lead in life. Um, and with that, any last, and we can try to answer a couple of questions before we're basically almost out of time. There are two addendums to this, just FYI for anyone who wants to see those. Annual savings needed by starting at different ages, and then retirement savings checkpoints. So some, again, another rules of thumb out there. Oops. So any questions, Jonathan, in in, in our one minute left over time here? Um, let's see. Um, so um, I think there, there was a question, and, and someone else sent me a question in the private chat um, about... Um, milestones for you know say if you're 40 50 60 assuming um you want to retire at jonathan uh, i think i should have clarified when they say aim to save one time your current income by 30 that means your current income at age 30 it doesn't mean your current income if you're you know already 50 uh so obviously uh, say you're 30 and you're earning X dollars a year, well, hopefully in 10 years, you're going to be earning more. Uh, and But that's the sum of your savings. That's not how much you save every year, obviously, but 
the, the sum of your retirement savings, if you're 30, should be one times your current income at age 30. By the time you're 40, uh, well, no, you have less time for your retirement earnings to themselves earn, so you need more money to get to the goal. And again, this is a guideline, uh, a rule of thumb. You, know, you can sit down and play with the figures using your own financial edit. It depends on the individual. That may be way high. It may be way low. Uh, you know, are you living within your income is one basic question there. Uh, but that's uh, hopefully a, a point of clarification. And that's why I said you know, take this particular rule of thumb with lots of grains of salt. Thank you. Um, thank you, Craig and Jim. Uh, this was really great. Um, I think a really um, appropriate way for us to close out uh, Financial Capability Month. So thank you again for uh, being here with us. Um, everyone that joined us today, uh, thank you also. And um, I know we didn't get to all the questions in the chat. Feel free to email us. Um, the business science and technology department, and um, we we can connect you to resources and information that hopefully will answer those questions. Um, and then, uh, yes, I will be sending out a uh, link to the recording and uh, copies of the slideshow. Um, you'll you should receive those later today. Um, so. Um, keep an eye out for that. I will also include a very brief survey. Um, uh, please take a moment to fill that out. It helps us uh, design the programming that we offer at the library, and it's really important for us to hear from, from all of you. So you again, yes. Yes. Point. Uh, this is the second year we've given this program as part of the financial week. Anyone who has suggestions for how we could improve uh, for presumably next year, uh, that would be most welcome. Is there things that we spent too much time on, things that we should emphasize more, things that we didn't cover at the risk of making the program even longer? But uh, any uh, critiques, criticisms, suggestions would be welcome. Yes, so please, everyone, uh, just take a take a moment to fill out that survey. It's really short. It's anonymous. Um, include some of that feedback that Jim was asking for, um, and we will get that to them. And it, it does. It really helps us um, uh, provide um, what what you all need. So um, thank you in advance for filling that out. And again, thank you, Craig and Jim. Um, hope to have you back soon uh, to talk more about investing in retirement. Great. Thanks for having us here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank everyone who attended. Hope it was helpful. Yep. Take care, everybody. Thank you. All right. Have a good afternoon, everyone, and keep an eye out for my email. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.